Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular lesson is lesson number six in this series, The Holy Spirit and Spirituality. And this particular lesson is entitled, The Holy Spirit and Living a Holy Life. Hmm, that's a challenge. This is lesson for February 11 of 2017. <coughs> and before we jump in, we, we should offer a word of prayer to, for the Spirit to guide us. Our kind and loving Father, we recognize your presence with us at all times, but we ask for a special guidance of your Holy Spirit as we now discuss this lesson with your friends, your children here on this earth. May it bring all of us nearer to your kingdom is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So, this lesson, we're going to focus on the relationship be between or among the Holy Spirit, sanctification, holiness, and love. Is there a relationship between those things or among those things? Shouldn't it be the goal of every Christian to become more and more holy? Anybody busy trying to become holy? We, 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 you know, in light of the fact that there are certain large Christian organizations have designated a certain number of people as saints, we've tended to say, well, no, no not, not so fast. But uh, wouldn't it be a good thing to be holy? Got a drill. Okay. What is the relationship between God's love and His holiness? That's a different kind of holy. Why is it that so many people want to focus on God's love and not many want to talk about His holiness? Does God's holiness seem stern and unforgiving or unapproachable? Seems more far off mm -hmm. as opposed to love, which seems more, you know, forgiving and, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we're much more willing to accept God's love than to think about His holiness because that could Seems be like scary. it's far away, huh? Yeah, yeah. And whenever an a angelic being appears uh, in Scripture, the reaction is people have fear, and the mm -hmm. first thing they have to say is, fear not. Yeah. Don't and, be afraid. And God says, stand up, I want to talk to you, every yeah. time. <laughs> so what's supposed to come into your mind when you hear the word holy? Well, and that's what we're trying to figure out here. Um, does God want us to be holy? What do you think? I, yes. Yeah, the Bible says that, but as soon as we figure out what, he, what he's trying well, to do. Okay, now to imagine, <laughs> let's, you know, in light of your question, let's imagine God is speaking to a group of ex-slaves. They've just come from Egypt. They're camped at the foot of Mount Sinai. And God says, be holy, and my, my Good News Bible says, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. They're living in tents. I don't know how they ever got a bath. Um, what? Be holy. Yeah, what does a slave that, know what about that, being holy? What does that mean? What does anyone know about being holy? Well, how about define the word or give a yeah. different word, okay? Well, before we set out, we should do that. Define holiness means to be set apart. This is what the technical biblical word means for both Hebrew and Greek. To be set apart for a special purpose. In this case, to become more like God. It means to be pure, righteous, loving, and kind. Those are the words that are often associated with that, okay? Is that, is that feasible? So, well, I know what you mean when you use the word holy, because it's always connected to God, but when you use that definition there, mm -hmm. you could say, I'm being holy when I join the army, because I'm being set, set apart for well, not, battle. Not, not for, well, for a special purpose, for a special I purpose. suppose technically, but in, in the biblical terms, it means to be set apart to become more like God. The military doesn't do that for you. Well, you said that just to be set apart, this is 
to do yeah. something. Technically, if you, on just the bare meaning of the word, to be set apart for a special purpose. So, yeah, you're set apart to be a private, you're set apart to be a general. Yeah, well, technically, you could be. Wh why, where would you use that technical um, definition? Because I've, on, I've only heard it connected with God. Uh -huh. How about the Sabbath? Yeah. Set apart for the Sabbath. That was well, keep the Sabbath day holy. Where's sanctified? That means to keep it apart, day. then, right? Where does everything else? Where does wearing a robe of Christ's righteousness fit in here? Yeah. Okay. We haven't got well. That's part of maybe part of sanctification. We're going to come upon coming up here. Because if he sees us as perfect because of the character of Christ, mm -hmm. we're on the road. Okay. Well, it's interesting to note that God is actually described more often as holy in the Bible than he is as loving. <coughs> we, we all know the passages, 1 John 4, 8, and 16, oh, God is love, and we, we love those passages. But um, what do we do for all, with all the passages that talk about God being holy? How many of those have you memorized? I have just a few here. Psalm 89, verse 18. You, O Lord, choose... I guess I should jump over. You, O Lord, chose our protector. You, the holy God of Israel, gave us our king. That's a great passage there. He is our protector. Yeah. When the devil's going around like a roaring lion or we wrestle not against flesh and blood, I mean, you Coming need the over, protector. Uh -huh. Coming over to the New Testament, each one of the four living creatures had six wings and they were covered with eyes inside and out. Day and night, they never stopped singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. And that verse could, we could have two, two or three hours of discussion of what that verse, all this implied by that verse. But here are the angels standing around the throne of God and they're saying, Holy, holy, holy. Uh, wh why are they repeating that word? Do they need to repeat it? Isn't it one time enough? Would it be correct to call holiness a definition of God's character? Answer that question. I'm going to. <laughs> Why would they keep saying, I've often thought that? Uh, repetition Why? is the equivalent of the superlative. Mm -hmm. Repetition most. in the Greek, I think it is. They don't have Especially more in and most. Especially Greek. in Hebrew. Okay. Mm. Yeah. They don't have more Constantly. and most, so they say holy, 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 instead of most holy. Constantly. Yeah, well, what, what's happening, I, here, here's the, my understanding of that, and I think I could get support this from Ellen White. What's hap what do you, think about God, he's in charge of, of what? Everything. Everything, entire universe. Do you think there are good news items that come into the throne of God about wonderful things that are happening here and there all over the universe on oh, a regular basis? I can I, I like that. <laughs> okay. And so when something wonderful like that is reported to the throne, what does what do the angels say? Oh, holy. Exactly. Uh, and where do you how do you know they're happy about that? Remember what it says in Luke let me just go there for just real quick. Luke uh, ten, I believe. Let's go to verse uh, about fifteen. Um, Uh, hold on here. I need, I, I need to go to. I need to go to uh, Luke 15. Uh, okay, and you come down, uh, down to verse seven, Luke uh, 15, verse seven. In the same way, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven. Wouldn't that be in, involving around the throne of God? Of course over one sinner who repents and over 99 respectable people who do not need to repent. And a little bit later it repeats that. So there's lots of reasons for saying holy, holy, holy as you're standing around the throne of God, I think. Heaven is rejoicing. It might not seem like it to us down here that what we're going through, but in heaven as they see the overall picture, they know that God's winning the great controversy. And they love it. Well, back in the beginning, God, uh, Satan wanted to have God's omniscience, his omnipresence, and especially his omnipotence. But he did not want to have God's character. 
would it be safe to have a ruler like that? Mm -hmm. Omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence, and the character of Satan. Maybe you should define what those terms mean for some that Well, omniscience means all-knowing, omnipresence means everywhere present, and omnipotence means all-powerful, as God is. Well... But how would God use the power? One thing yeah. he can't do is force any of his creatures to love. Yeah, that's, that's the point. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, do he, could, he creates things, he heals things. Mm-hmm. But what I'm just saying, but well, the people ask for something to happen. Maybe the Holy Spirit come into somebody's life and change the way they think. It doesn't work that way. It, yeah, the Holy Spirit will continue to give evidence and and woo them. But ultimately, that this, if you don't choose the right way, you you're going to make a choice. Everybody will make a choice. God has the power to do that, but His character okay. prevents Him from doing it. Exactly. He, exactly. he honors our freedom, our choice, our will. That's the way he is. He's always that way. He's gracious. He's not, he doesn't parcel out grace a little, like, out of a vial or something. He's just a gracious being. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have any questions about God's purity? Other I'm, than I'm, what Satan accuses him of. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's why I'm asking this question. Satan has accused God of all kinds of stuff. So do we have any questions about God's holiness? Well, if we've seen Jesus, we've seen the Father, mm -hmm. so we, if we see that he is holy and he is pure and sinless, then we can trust that the Father is also. Do you think that there's any evil in God at all? No. No. Mm -hmm. No, in fact, it says in James, get there in time. I should punch it in on the computer. Mm -hmm. uh, that he can't be tempted by evil. Yeah. Romans. Uh, James 1.13. James 1, 13. Yeah, 13 1 to 13. 13. God cannot be tempted and he tempts no one. Mm -hmm. Right. It's so in other words, you can't do anything to change God's mind. Mm -hmm. eh? God is always going to be the same way. You're not, you can't get, uh, give him offerings because he is he's in need of nothing. God is devoted completely to seeking the good of those he loves. So we see in the, in the example of God's life, his holy life, it means to be as separated as far as possible from sin. I mean, isn't that what God would like? Well, we've talked about the holy, holy, holy thing. That's found in the Old Testament, Isaiah 6, verse 3, and it's repeated in the New Testament. We've already looked at Re Revelation 4, 8. Um, so how does that relate to us? Well, isn't that the definition of sin? It's disconnected from God? Yeah. So it's not like God disconnected himself from sin mm -hmm. because the disconnect is, is the sin. What, what would happen if we actually started to become holy? Here's what, here's what Ellen White says, Steps to Christ, page 64 and 65. The closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes. For your vision will be clearer and your imperfections will be seen in broad and distinct contrast to his perfect nature. This is evidence that, this, that Satan's delusions have lost their power, that the vivifying influence of the Spirit of God is arousing you. So what's happened as we try to become, as we <coughs> let the Holy Spirit have more and more influence in our lives? We, 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 the, the, the bad filters, the, dis, the confusing filters that Satan tries to throw in front of our eyes melt away. They're gone. <coughs> Excuse me. He must increase and I must decrease. Yeah. So we could say, and I'm going to say it right now, and if you want to disagree with me, good. That's, that's, that'll lead to discussion. It's God's earnest desire that all of his children, including all of us, become like Jesus. That is, holy. He wants us to be holy, pure, and without fault. What would happen if he had a group of people who were holy, pure, and without fault 
in right now, what would happen? I suspect the end would come. It would be such an inf overwhelming influence to the whole world that uh, everyone would make a decision. Is, is That's what he's waiting for. Yeah. I'm waiting for that. Would it be correct to say that the holiness is not only God's gift but his command? Well, it says be holy, mm -hmm. you know, so. Sounds like a command, when, doesn't it? Right. When God speaks and it is so and he commands and it stands fast, his, cre his word is creative. So, uh, and Ellen White says all his biddings are enablings, mm -hmm. which is kind of another way to say the same thing. Yeah. When he says something, within that is the power to do it. Um, would, would it be correct to say that holiness is equal to Christ-likeness? Mm -hmm. Is that possible for people living in the 21st century? Well, the, when the mind of Christ is re perfectly reproduced, isn't that how it goes? Yeah. Uh, I stopped the, less than 68, 69, yeah. Yeah. And uh, character of Christ. Yeah. And, it, yeah. and I think that's just basically doing, willing to do the will of the Father, which is what he came to do. Let's take a moment and look at Galatians 5.23. We've looked at this before, but actually we should start with 22. But the Spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and I want to focus on the last part, the self-control. There's no law against such things as these. We, we all know about that. Okay, so now let's talk about that. What is implied by that? If we've come to understand God and His character so well, we would never want to do anything wrong. If we could get to that place, it is not, is not so that we can do what we want to do. Instead, it is so that we, He can safely admit us to heaven and not have to worry that we might disrupt His kingdom. So in other words, when we talk about self-control at the end of, of, after we've received the Spirit, what we're really saying is, ability to do what God wants us to do because we want to do it. It's called at one minute. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, we know that there's some contradictory ideas here. What do we do with places like 1 Corinthians 1, 2? It says, to the church of God which is in Corinth, to all who are called to be God's holy people, who belong to him in union with Christ Jesus, together with all people everywhere who worship our Lord Jesus Christ, and their Lord and ours. God's holy people, the ones who lived in Corinth, mm -hmm. they're called to be. <laughs> well, that, doesn't that fit your first definition better, the set-apart people? Mm -hmm. So they were set-apart, it doesn't really <laughs> tell you that they're <laughs> the best people in the world. Or the children of Israel. You, you must be, you, you if, be holy because I am holy there. And if, set apart. If, if we were speaking Latin, we would be calling them saints. Were the church members in Corinth all saints with somebody living with his mother-in-law and so <laughs> forth like that? Probably none of them were saints. <laughs> Does that mean none of us are capable of being saints either? Well, I I think maybe none of us are saints now. Maybe we're capable of it in the future. But you think we're worse than the people who lived in Corinth? I think we're no better. <laughs> He's heading his bats here. <laughs> okay. Look at Hebrews 12, verse 14. Try to be at peace with everyone and try to live a holy life because no one will see the Lord without it. Okay, do we want to see the Lord someday? Absolutely. So we ought to be working on being holy, right? Anybody halfway to being a saint? <laughs> well, I don't know that we're in any position to judge our, our own condition that way. Uh, we were to examine ourselves, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 13, 5, I think it is, mm -hmm. to see whether we're in the faith. But the closer we come to Christ, the more... Uh, sinful we appear in our eyes, so we're, we're really not in a position to say 
uh, whether we're uh, okay. So it so creates a condun conundrum yeah. there. So let me ask it this way: Do we are we do we need to is holiness a, a, a goal to be reached or is it a process? Process. Can we? We can enter into, uh, the, you know, a state of holiness to the extent that we trust Him, um, and we can I, grow. I mean, it's not like there's a, an end result, because ultimately God is, yeah, is the standard of holiness. So yeah. we're we're really approaching God, <coughs> on a path of holiness. Aren't we aren't we all God's children? Wouldn't that shouldn't that make us holy? Well, isn't isn't God holy? Yeah. He's not on the path. He's made it. He made it? Well, he's, he's made it. He made the path. He's He yeah. didn't attain holiness or find But if you say hol holiness is a, path, is a process, then what right. process is God going through when you call him holy? Because he's there. He's perfect. He's the source of it. There is no other source of it. He he we, always was. Well, that's, I'm talking about the process that we were talking about. If well, it's a process no for process. us because we don't we're not holy, so we have to. Were Adam and approach. Eve holy? Sure. Yeah. So because of sin, we're no longer holy. So now we're trying to regain that. I I have a feeling that. When we get to heaven, we're going to be so excited about learning more about God and becoming more like Him. We're going to be excited about that process for the rest of eternity. I don't think we're ever going to be tired of it. Heaven begins here, so mm -hmm. we can, yeah, we can start getting excited. Look, look at a few verses. He's 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 been talking about the problems, drunkards and slanders, and all that kind of stuff. in, in First Corinthians uh, six, verse eleven. Some of you are like that, but you have been purified from sin, you have been dedicated to God, you have been put right with God by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. How does that work? Put right by Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Titus 3 verse 5 says, He saved us. It was not because of any good deeds that we ourselves had done, but because of His own mercy that He saved us through the Holy Spirit who gives us new birth and new life by washing us. And of course, that's an allusion to baptism. And what about Hebrews 13, 12? For this reason, Jesus also died outside the city in order to purify the people from sin with his own blood. How does that work? Can we really be purified from sin? I hope we so. Can, we can die. If we we're dead, then we are dead to sin, and through mm -hmm. the Spirit, we are uh, a new life is created, and we can walk in newness of life. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, where does holiness and sanctification actually come from? God. And how do we get it? Through the Holy Spirit in Christ. Well, Hebrews eleven six says, "No one can please God." without faith. For whoever comes to God must have faith that God exists and rewards those who seek Him. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like the process here would, is obviously related to, as we suggested back at the beginning of our lesson, has something to do with faith, right? Mm -hmm. Look at 1 Peter 1 verse 2. You were chosen according to the purpose of God the Father and were made a holy people by His Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be purified by His blood. So all three members of the Godhead are apparently are working, are, are want to work on making us better and hurt, healthier and holier and what's the Old Testament expression? Healthy, holy, happy? It's interesting, we looked at Galatians 5.23, but look at Galatians 5.16 and 17, before, a few verses before that. What I say is this, let the Spirit direct your lives and you will not satisfy the desires of the human nature. For what our human nature wants is opposed to what the Spirit wants and what the Spirit wants is opposed to what our human nature wants. These two are enemies and this means that you cannot do what you want to do. But verse 23 says God wants you to have self-control. 
But 16 already said, I, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Mm -hmm. So, um, so there's a conflict there, of mm -hmm. course, but, um, but it sets out the path. If we walk by the Spirit, mm -hmm. uh, Romans says the same thing, that yeah. uh, we will not carry out the deeds of the flesh. Let us never forget that the great controversy is being fought right now and it's happening between our ears. We are born sinners. Sin dwells in us, Romans 7. So what is the secret to becoming more like Jesus? Hmm. In Romans, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. In Hebrews 11, we're given a kind of gallery, a kind of hall of fame of saints. You know, it starts off with Abel and, and, and then it works down and a lot of the book of the chapter talks about Abraham and Sarah, but then it goes down and it ends up talking about Rahab and Samson and Jephthah and all those people. This is a sort of a hall of fame for, for saints. And then coming to chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, remember that, of course, in the original there were no chapter or verse divisions. As for us, now he's going to talk about us, we have this large crowd of witnesses around us. So, that, so then let us rid ourselves of everything that gets in the way of the sin that holds on to us so tightly and let us run with determination the race that lies before us. Let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus on whom our faith depends from beginning to end. He did not give up because of the cross. On the contrary, because of the joy that was waiting for him, he thought nothing of the disgrace of dying on the cross and he is now seated at the right-hand side of God's throne. In other words, if you keep your eyes on him and you keep focusing on that, where are you going to, where are you going to end up? His kingdom. His kingdom. Standing around God's throne, right? A little hall of fame. A little hall of fame, okay. <laughs> so, the battle, so the battle is not here to... Our, our, to have capacity to fight people. Our battle is to find the time and the will to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. When we do that, the Holy Spirit will make the necessary changes in our minds, our thoughts, and in our characters to prepare us to become citizens of the heavenly kingdom. And I quote now from Great Controversy, page 555, it is a law. When we say something is a law, what does that mean? That it's it can't be violated. You may the law of gravity. You nobody's figured out how to violate the law of gravity yet. Now we can fly airplanes and all that kind of stuff, but it's still they're obeying the law of gravity. So it is a law both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature that by beholding we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated to that which is accustomed to love and reverence. Man will never rise higher than his standard of purity or goodness or truth. If self is his loftiest ideal, he will never attain to anything more exalted. Rather, he will constantly sink lower and lower. The grace of God alone has power to exalt man. Left to himself, his course must inevitably be downward. And that's really out, uh, taken uh, an expansion on a few verses in Scripture. For example, 1 John 3, 1 to 3. See how much the Father has loved us. His love is so great that we are called God's children. And so, in fact, we are. That is why the world does not know us. It has not known God. My dear friends, we are now God's children. But it is not yet clear what we shall become. But we know that when Christ appears, <coughs> excuse me, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he really is. Everyone who has this hope in Christ keeps himself pure just as Christ is pure. There's no other way. Jesus himself stated very clearly, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He doesn't say there's five different ways. There's one way. So God calls us to keep his law. But if we cannot be saved by keeping the law, why do we need to keep it? We will keep it uh, if 
we're walking out the spirit. But as I said, there's we need <coughs> uh, sometimes we need feedback mechanisms because we need to know uh, if what we're following is the right thing. Like it with balance, we have visual. Uh, our eyes tell us, uh, ground us to our surroundings, our inner ear, uh, to gravity and motion and our uh, senses and our uh, proprioception and others to the, to the ground and what we're touching. And mm -hmm. the integration of those things keeps us uh, balanced and we can move quickly. If you lose one of those, you can still kind of function, but it's not, not as fast. I mean, you could run if you're blind, but it's not <laughs> recommended because you crash yeah. into something. But um, you can compensate with your eyes if you lose sensation in your feet, for instance. Mm -hmm. but, um, but we need feedback. We need feedback from others. We need each other to feedback uh, what, how, we're, how we're doing. We need the, the law to tell us if indeed what we're doing is following the spirit. Mm -hmm. So we always come back to that as a reference yeah. point. The law, we say, we just say, is a reflection of God's character. It is holy, righteous, and good. Oh, you, that, if we had time, we would, we would look at the verses in the scripture that describe the law like that. The only other thing or person described with those three attributes in scripture is God himself. So, I quote now from Signs of the Times, August 2, 1899. It is essential to our eternal well-being to know more of God. For love to God depends on a conception of His goodness, His excellence, and a knowledge of His will. It requires an appreciation of His character. His law is the transcript of His character. And this law He calls upon us to obey. God calls for an entire surrender of the entire being. So is trying to keep the law legalism? Or is it faithfulness? Depends on <coughs> whether we walk by sight or faith. Okay. You know, the, they did, didn't keep the law. I, is it in Romans? They approached it as if it were by works and not right. by faith. Yeah. Well, yes. If we are trying to earn our salvation, by keeping the law, that's legalism. Okay. But it's meritous, you know, if we're trying to gain merit through doing it. Our Bible study guide puts it this way, and I'd like you to tell me what you think of this. The law is never our way to salvation. Rather, it is the path of the saved. It's never a way to salvation. It's the path of the saved. What does that mean? Well, it's a direction. Okay. Um, of course, I, I, I look at Jesus as the living law. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, mm -hmm. with the Ten Commandments, that's just ten textual characteristics. But when you look at Jesus, you're actually looking at the the law or the, that being lived out. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. filled out a lot better than just looking at that text. There's a very famous verse found in Romans 13, verse 10. If you love someone, you will never do them wrong. To love then is to obey the whole law. Is that, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What did Jesus say about love? What's the, first, what's the great commandment? Love, your, love, love God. Love your neighbor. And, your neighbor. and the second one is like unto it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Could we unhesitatingly say that to love then is to obey the whole law? Do we really agree with that verse? Well, there's a fulfillment of the law, isn't it? Yeah. And Romans 2, 14, when those who do not have the law do what the law requires. Okay. Law. If we could truly love God, that would be the first commandment, and love our neighbor, would we be, pre would we be prepared to enter the kingdom of heaven? You wouldn't be self-centered, would you? Mm -hmm. We would have already entered the kingdom of heaven. Because the, heaven can the, be kind the, of begins The end. Pharisees demonstrated that it's possible to, to follow the letter of the law without love. But I would say it's not possible to exhibit true love without keeping the law. Is that true? 
Or maybe when you truly love, you are keeping the law. Well, yeah, that's, that's another way of saying I think the same thing. But one's, there are two different approaches. One is trying to get love by reading the oh, text. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. doing the law. Mm -hmm. And as you do the law, you're actually fulfilling the... As you <laughs> really love, you're fulfilling the law. Okay, so he, let's, let's just review that again. You can, you can try, you can make your own efforts, and you can kill yourself going to the process of trying mechanically to do what you think God wants you to do. You can do that, mm -hmm. and you can be a Pharisee. On the other hand, you can say, God, I want to learn to be really loving. I want to really do this. Show me how. Guide me. And if you really love your neighbor, and if you really love God, would you break any of the Ten Commandments? Oh, you would be living them out. Yeah. Uh, one way to illustrate it would be like with the rainbow. Mm -hmm. What What is this on this page? It's a, a lot of colors. Okay. It looks like a rainbow. All right, so it looks like a rainbow. It's not a real rainbow. How yeah. is a real rainbow made? Light. 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 Mm -hmm. Refracted. Refracted through a some type of prism. Yeah. Okay, and that's how righteousness comes to us. We behold the light of the glory of God in the face of Christ, and that we become, we then reflect the, that glory. Mm -hmm. uh, and instead of just uh, the primary colors, we reflect all of them, which mm -hmm. are continuous from one end to the other. So it's much deeper and much richer than what we can see by just illustrating it. We need Il ways to illustrate things and mm -hmm. yeah. the law can feed back to us and such mm -hmm. but it's ultimately in and of itself it's not how righteousness comes about yeah. Psalms 15 1 and 2 Ephesians 4 22 to 24 and first and second Timothy 2 21 suggests that only those who are obedient to God and who are true and sincere and do what is right will enter God's temple is that the same as being saved? What's our own personal experience? Is being holy a very strict and unhappy condition? Or is holiness a precondition for enjoying the happiness which comes from fellowship with God? Well, here's another comment from Ellen White. This is Christ Object Lessons, page 332. A character formed according to the divine likeness, is the only treasure that we can take from this world to the next. Those who are under the instruction of Christ in this world will take every divine attainment with them to the heavenly mansions. And in heaven we are continually to improve. How important then is the development mm. of character in this life? Mm. Quite, a, quite a statement, huh? So, it sounds like if we start out as sinners and we want to reach that level, the time has come for developing new habits, habits of righteousness and obedience, right? Is it easy to develop a new habit? I think no. the, old, the older you get, the harder it is. <laughs> well, in Hebrews 12, it says, um, uh, for, uh, where is that now? For... All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful. It's gone yeah. through this whole thing on discipline, but yet sorrow, sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it afterward, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So mm -hmm. uh, at first there's a struggle, but later on you find it easy to do what's right. Are we all busy developing the characteristics in, from Galatians 5, 23? Remember, Patience, love, faithfulness, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control? Mm -hmm. Is there a magic way to get those things? Mm -mm. I think of the story of Benjamin Franklin who had his own <laughs> wayward tendencies. Uh, the women over in France, he, he liked them quite a lot. But anyway, uh, you remember he set his list. At the bottom of his list was being humble finally got down he thought he had accomplished all those other things and the bottom the last item was be humble he says man I'm so good how could I possibly be humble <laughs> proud of being humble huh? yeah. yeah well 
Well, we need to be focused on others. Yeah. There's a, a, a story told of a man touring hell, and he sees everybody is weak and emaciated. You probably heard this, mm -hmm. I don't know, but maybe they have it out there. And, and he asked the guide, why don't you have any food here for these people? And he says, oh, yes, we have food. And there's these tables, and they're all full of food. And, but he says, this is how they have to eat. There's this uh, utensil with a grip on one end, and there's all these spikes and sharp things. And then way out here is the fork or whatever. And they can't get to it, so they're starving. Mm -hmm. So they go to heaven, and everybody's healthy and happy and sees the same tables, the same utensils, and says, what's, what's the difference? And he says, well, here they feed each other. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how we have to be. It's mm -hmm. not, I got to develop this quality, you know, inward gazing so much as, as seeing Christ in the needs around us. If you've done it to the least of these, my brother, you've done it unto me. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking for uh, not just for our own needs, but for the needs of others, we, uh, then we can be channels of those qualities. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think uh, is one of the... So let's just think about some of the things that prevent us from actually doing these things we talk about here. I don't think... Most of the faithful Seventh day Adventists are busy out there painting the town red, as we sometimes say, and, and carrying on with prostitutes and all that kind of stuff. So, what are the sins of the saints? Now, we don't need to, we don't need to discuss our own personal experiences in great detail, but I have a feeling that one of the biggest problems that we as, as so called saints have is that. We're just too busy. Mm -hmm. We're just, maybe we're doing a lot of good things. But we're too busy to do what's really important. Sower went forth to sow, and there were mm -hmm. those who were... There's the, something to do is seek ye the kingdom of God first. First. These other things will be added to us. But you think you are. You think you're, you're searching for that, and you realize that you have forgotten to be kind to your neighbor. You have forgotten because you're so busy, you don't have time for that. You know, they may need a ride home, but you don't have time for that because you've got to get on with your stuff. Yeah. Like the priest and the Levite who went by the past. You know, it could be dangerous to stop and help this guy, you know. Yeah. And then I'd have to go through this purification process, and mm -hmm. it would just mess everything up. <laughs> Yeah, and you know that Ellen White says that that priest and that Levite were in the crowd when Christ told that story. Oh. I wonder what they thought. Wow. Hmm. Well, so what is our real need? What are our what? What are the real desperate need? I mean, we're 172 years following the Great Disappointment. 172 years. There's got to be some, some kind of a problem going on here, right? What's our big need? Well, Ellen White put it this way, Review on Herald of February 9 of 1892, the Spirit of God as it comes into the heart by faith is the beginning of the life eternal. What promise is less fulfilled in the church than that of the endowment of the Holy Spirit? Here is our greatest need. So what is she saying there? What we need most of all is the endowment of the Holy Spirit. Well, a little bit later, in another place, this would be Home, home Missionary, November 1, it's Gospel Workers, the 1892 edition, page 370. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. Okay, we must have the holy unction from God, the baptism of His Spirit. So again, what is she saying? We get these things by experiencing the Holy Spirit, right? For this is the only efficient agent in the promulgation of sacred truth. It is the Spirit of God that quickens the lifeless faculties of the soul to appreciate heavenly things and attracts the affections toward God and the truth. What is it again? 
a revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. In another place, she rewords it like this, a revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek, to seek this should be our first work. There must be earnest effort to obtain the blessing of the Lord, not because God is not willing to bestow his blessing upon us, but because we are unprepared to receive it. Bill, what did you say a little while ago? The problem is we're not prepared to receive it. Our Heavenly Father is more willing to give His Holy Spirit to them that ask Him than our earthly parents to give, good gifts, to give good gifts to their children. But it is our work by confession, humiliation, repentance, and earnest prayer to fulfill the conditions upon which God has promised to grant us His blessing. I know there are several people in this room who have grandchildren. And when Christmas time comes, what happens? <laughs> oh, it's so hard. <laughs> Just really difficult to buy anything oh, for our grandchildren, huh? Not to buy. It. <laughs> <laughs> so if we really just love to give our grandchildren gifts, what is God doing? Mm. He wants to give us the most important gift of all, and we're saying, uh, I'm not quite ready. What, what are we saying? I'm too busy. I'm too busy. Mm. Well, she goes on in that same paragraph, a revival need be expected only in answer to prayer. While the people are so destitute of God's Holy Spirit, they cannot appreciate the preaching of the Word, but when the Spirit's power touches their hearts, then the discourses given will, will not be without effect. Guided by the teachings of God's Word, with the manifestation of His Spirit, and the exercise of sound discretion, well, you've got quite a few conditions here, huh? Mm. Those who attend our meetings will gain a precious experience, and returning home will be prepared to exert a healthful influence. What were those things again? Guided by the teachings of God's Word, what do we call that? Bible. Bible, Bible study, study, right? With the manifestation of His Spirit, that's the, that's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, right? That's, the, that's the, the former rain, the latter rain. And in the exercise of sound discretion, that means, what did you call it, Jim? Making the right choices? That's our part, isn't it? Yeah. Our Those who attend our meetings will gain a precious experience. So we need Bible study, we need the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and we need to make right choices, right? Is it ever, is it even possible for us to grasp an understanding of the holiness of God, which seems to be the absolute antithesis to our own selfishness and depravity? When we're so bound up in our own sins, and God says, Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy, we say, which, which will did you come from, right? Heavenly well, would God, and, and of course we know, that was Leviticus 19.2 that I just read from, the New King James Version. Would God have asked his children at the foot of Mount Sinai to be holy if it weren't possible? Hmm. If he had not made it possible. I mean, we have to say no, don't we? So there's a close connection in the scriptures between holiness, covenant or God's promises and ag or agreements, and the law. Without the help of the Holy Spirit, we cannot develop a successful relationship with God, which we call faith, and we certainly cannot obey the law, His law. So how, what, what, is, what is faith, just very briefly, in this context? Faith is a relationship with God. It means as, 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 as with a friend. It means getting to know Him, getting to appreciate Him, getting to love Him, getting to want to be more like Him. So what would it mean to actually have God's law written in our hearts and minds? We would delight to do His will. Mm -hmm. 
So now, in summing up a little bit of what we've looked at, what comes to your mind first when you think about God's holiness? His character. I wish I could have some. Mm. Probably not. <laughs> we think of his character. We think of awe. We think of Reverence, respect. Reverence, respect. Yeah. It's so perfect yeah. that you can't quite grasp it and you want to go, I'm never going to get there anyway. Yeah. So. Mm. Don't understand it. Yeah. Can't understand it. What, what, why is that? Because we're not. I'm sorry. Because so yeah, we're not. That's <laughs> yeah. Okay. And we've already said that, uh, you know, in the Bible, when uh, even an angel appeared to somebody, what did they do? Down on their face. And But God always said what? Stand up, I want to talk to you. Is it because His holiness, holiness is a goal that we have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit to attain? Is that the problem? It's not just something, I mean, we've already said, one verse we read said it's a gift from God. So is it, is it really the destination or is it the journey? I think we've already come to the conclusion that it has to more to do with the journey. journey. Yeah. If we're headed, if we see Jesus in front of us and we want to be more like him and we're focused on that and we're headed in that direction, holiness can be a journey. Isn't that what the first vision was with Jesus Ellen White? going up? Mm -hmm. So faith is the only key to salvation and it comes through prayer, Bible study, meditation, witnessing. Through these avenues, we follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Obedience brings us closer and closer to the very essence of the character of God. As we noted earlier in Great Controversy 555, it is by beholding His character and by focusing on how we can become more like Jesus that faith grows and character is changed. Now, um, there are various ways of putting this. I remember someone who described it like this. If, and, and maybe if you always lived in Southern California, it would be hard to understand this. But if you had a, a field that was just covered with fresh snow, and it's fairly deep, but someone says, okay, I want you to walk right straight across the field. What's the only safe way to do that? Keep your eyes focused on something on the other end. You've got to be focused exactly on what's at the other end. Because if you look at people, you know, if, if, if some people walk along and they look back to see if they're doing a good job and what happens, <laughs> and they're off. And, you know, the people are looking here and there and they're wandering around like this. The only way to walk straight in the path ahead, straight in the right direction, is to keep your eyes focused on where you're headed. Mm -hmm. Look at 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. Instead, and here's Peter right in the New Testament. Instead, be holy in all that you do, just as God who called you is holy. The scripture says, be holy because I am holy. Um, and we are reminded, and in Patriarchs and Prophets, it says, 596 paragraph 2 in a little different wording, it is a law of the mind that it gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is trained to dwell. If we think that our most important time is spent watching television, how does that impact us? Become think of like all. What? We'll become like what we behold. Yeah. Isn't that what's changing our world? It just seems like the violence and the people feeding off mm -hmm. yeah. the things that they see. Okay, so in conclusion, we've talked a lot about holiness. We've talked about becoming more like God. Why is that really important? In, in connection with God's law, we said back at the beginning of our lesson, in the gift, and I'm, I'm going to know, I'm, I wouldn't pretend to do this myself, I'm going to quote directly from Signs of the Times, 
November 17, 1898, Helen White, in the gift of God's dear son, a definite view of his character has been given to the race that is never absent from his mind. His very heart is laid open in the royal law. That infinite standard, that royal law, is presented to all that there may be no mistake in regard to that kind of people God would have compose his kingdom. It is only those who are obedient to all his commandments and who will, who will become members of the royal family, children of the heavenly king. These will be honored with a citizenship above, a life that measures with the life of God, a life without sorrow, pain, or death throughout eternal ages. Wow. Mm. By looking at, studying about, and focusing on the life of Christ, do you find him attractive? Do you wish that you could become more like him? Remember our passage in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2? We live in a feel-good, often self-centered society. It is easy for those in that situation to practice, or is it easy for those in that situation to practice self-denial, obedience, and holiness? It's just the opposite. The world is pressing as fast as they can go in one direction, and we're trying to go in the other way. To many so-called Christians, these ideas may seem to be unintelligible. It does, it's, it's not even comprehensible. It, it's, how, how can we do it? So can we really develop the new habits and practices that we need to, need to develop to help us become more and more like Jesus? Yes. What, what things in our lives detract us from living holy lives? Think of your own personal experience, and now I'm asking you out there. Think of your own personal experience. Does living a life of holiness seem like an impossible challenge? How could we change that? Is it possible for us, even in our day, to focus on Jesus Christ? To really want to, to look back at his life that spread out on the pages, pages of Scripture and say, I want that. I want to become like him. If we can do that, it is. And if we do it, not if we can, not only can do it, but if we actually do it, our lives will be changed and we will become like Him. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is for us to gather together and study Your Word and share it with others. We pray that Your guidance will make these words meaningful to those who have listened in. May it come to fruition also in our own lives is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.